Alia, welcome to the show. Um, very excited as one of my new friends, new people that I've met in the not too, uh, not too sort of distant past. Um, I'm very excited to tell your story. As you know, I have a particular excitement around your business and what you're doing. I really think it's amazing and I, I see such a huge, huge future for it, as you, as you well know, as we talk about very many times. But no one else knows what we're talking about yet. So let's first start by you telling us a little bit about, before we get onto you and on your sort of journey, just talk about storytelling and what it is so we can sort of frame that for, for the viewers. Yeah, for sure. So look, storytelling, we're an app that helps people capture their life story and share them with family and friends. And essentially what we believe is that everyone has a reason to cap want to capture their family stories, right? So um, it, it could be to document and preserve your family culture, your traditions, your heritage. It, it could be because you have a particular family member who has this like amazing story that you just want to capture. Like let's say maybe you have a grandfather who fought in World War II, right? And, and that's yep. the story you just really need to capture. Um, maybe it's your own legacy that, that you're seeking to document or preserve for your kids. Maybe you're a parent and you, you want to capture your own parenting experiences for your children, great-grandchildren, great-great-great-grandchildren. Yep. Um, or maybe you just want a more meaningful way to engage with other people in, in your, your network that is has got a lot more substance in it. Uh, and, and that's what we're trying to come in and do, right? Um, and, you know, provide a guided storytelling process to help people to, to capture, preserve, and privately, securely share these really meaningful moments with one another. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I, and I love, you know, I love storytelling. Um, I think... And, and you confirm this. When I first heard you pitch this business, which was what was it? Only a couple of months ago now. It wasn't wasn't long. Yeah. Um, to me, it was just this magical bringing together of an Instagram and an Ancestry.com and and having it all visual, right? And that's that's what I just think is. It, to me, it's the first time I've heard a really positive pitch of what is a form of social media. Is that is that a fair way of looking at it? Yeah, I mean, meaningful connection, right? Yeah. Um, how, how do we bring meaning back in? And, and also privacy and security. I, I think that's the, the other part of it as well. Um, yeah, I, I hear that for sure. Okay, now let's talk about you because your story is fascinating. Storytelling is very new, so we're pre-revenue, right? So we haven't, haven't even launched the app yeah. yet. That's happening very soon. We'll, we'll come back to that. But let's talk yeah. about how you've ended up being a founder in this business and, and we'll come to where it's going later. But let's go back as far as you want because um, your, your history is really interesting. So I want to hear. Tell, tell, us, tell us all about it. Come on. All right. Well, birth, born, raised Vancouver, <laughs> right? If we want to go all the way back to the beginning, yeah, um, but let's fast forward through the first 17 <laughs> years or so. And um, okay, look, I was so excited. I get a letter. I got into Harvard for my undergrad, right? Yep. It's huge, huge accomplishment huge. For, for an immigrant family. I pack myself up, move to Boston, get into the dorm. And then the night before our first day of classes, 9-11 happens. Now, I, I don't even know if I, if I talked to you about this, Steve, but you didn't. I'm an Ismaili Muslim. So Ismailis were a minority interpretation of Islam, um, Sufi, Shia, uh, but but a minority within the Shia tradition. Yeah. Yep. Now, there, there are a lot of us in Canada and, and we have a really strong value placed on, on education, gender equality, which... Uh, has has enabled us to have like an Ismaili mayor, an Ismaili senator, an Ismaili even lieutenant governor, right, in Canada. <laughs> um, so Canadians know who Ismaili Muslims are, right? It, yep. It's an identity that makes sense. Um, Australians definitely don't. I'm, I'm sure you've never heard of the Ismailis before, right? And and Americans don't either, right? So 9-11 happens and I've moved into this new campus, uh, making new friends. And all of a sudden I realized I'm not just an Ismaili, I am I'm a Muslim. I'm a brown Muslim. And I'm, I'm a brown Muslim in a country where what it means to be a person of color at, at a time where what it means to be a Muslim just simply didn't understand uh, or didn't align really with, with my own understandings yeah. of, of myself, of, of what I thought my religion, my culture, my ethnicity, my identity to be. 
Um, and, and it started this like really long journey of self-exploration, right? So uh, a lot of my time at Harvard, I mean, my, my, my main degree was in film production, but I ended up doing a lot of Islamic studies on the side because I was trying to figure out from an intellectual level, what does it mean to be a, a Muslim? And then I finished my undergrad and go on, I did some travels, but then I went on and did a PhD, a master's PhD, and it's so like essentially just spent this like, you know, so my PhD, it's, it's in social anthropology. And actually that's kind of important because this comes back, right? It gave me these core skills. Yep. But essentially what I did with my PhD, I moved to this, this village on the border between Tajikistan and Afghanistan um, and, and spent a year living with an Ismaili Muslim community. I actually shot a film about this, but essentially what I was studying was the intersection between politics, economics, and religion in the aftermath of the Soviet Union. But this core wow. skill that I gained through all of this is the ability to elicit life stories. And, and what happens is that, you know, I, I come out of my PhD, I'm like much more, you know, 10 years later, I have Yep. Know, I'm exaggerating, but you know, after this entire journey, I, I have a strong sense of who I am. Um, but all of a sudden I have a PhD and I didn't really know what to do with that. Right. <laughs> because, um, <laughs> a- a- academia, like it's, it, it's got, it's, it's so important. Um, but the pace of change is just much slower than yeah. the pace of change I was looking for, right? I wanted to affect change today. Uh, and, and that's what led me to start working with the Ismaili community, right? I spent all these years studying what it meant to be an Ismaili. So I started working with the community. And, and those skills of listing life stories enabled me to spend the next 10 years traveling the world, collecting people's life stories. Um, yeah. So I, I did that. And I was that person that the Ismaili community kind of asked to go go and, 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 and study. Um, so you know, studied various different topics around that, but I was also helping communities on the ground, um, you know, went back to the U S and pre-Trump America, helping Israeli Muslim youth navigate Islamophobia. And then in 2016, I, w- I was sent to Australia. Um, and I was the first CEO of the Aga Khan council for Australia and New Zealand and Papua New Guinea. And, and that was sort of my, my first exposure to what I like to call sort of a bit of a startup experience, right? Because yeah. I was setting up institutions, setting up frameworks for the social governance of the Ismaili community. Now, um, gained really great skills through this entire process, but essentially what I, I come back to what I was saying earlier, right? Like what I learned through all of this is that everyone has a really good reason to want to capture their family stories. Um, yep. For some, it's about culture and identity. Um, like that was that was my driver, right? Um, for others, it's to, to preserve the stories of their family members or themselves. And the entire process brings people closer together because it helps us to understand similarities, differences, what it really means to be human. Um, and so I sat down in last year in the middle of COVID and was like, how do I do this? How do I help people to capture their life stories? Um, and it's hard, right? It's really hard. It's, it's really labor intensive and time consuming. You need to sit down with someone. You need to talk to them. You need to know what questions to ask. Um, you, you, you need to then figure out what to do with the, the stories that have been captured. And that's when I realized we needed a tech solution. We needed something that could scale my expertise and then enable families to do this for themselves. So that that was like the planting of the seed of the idea of storytelling. So anyone who's listening to this show has just gone, wow, because you've just hit everyone with just this huge amount of information, which was incredible. And I've not heard you tell that whole story. I've heard parts of that before, but that's that's an incredible story. And you've achieved a hell of a lot. I mean, the Harvard, the living, the PhD, the studying, the capturing people's stories, which I assume you would have done through film in, in quite a lot of manners, and then coming up with where you are now. What an incredible um, journey. I think it's great when you get these founders who don't just come up with an idea, they've come up with an idea because of the experiences they've had through their life. And I think that's when, and that's why I, that's what sort of got me so excited about the business when I first heard it is I can hear why you've done it you know there's a real why in there and it's not just oh there's a problem it's like this has come from years and years and years of living and going i need to do something and i think that's i think that's awesome so congratulations by the way there was such that was so well delivered um now let's talk about how you ended up with storytelling because obviously you've come through the antler program um we've had a lot of different people um, come through the Antler program on this show. We've had the Antler, we've had um, the Antler, people from Antler on this show as well. I mean, you know, we're a big fan of big fan of the way they work. But how did you end up at Antler, and your how did you find your co-founders, and and where are you now with that journey of storytelling? Yeah. So 
Antler was sort of the answer to my question of how, right? Yep. I had this amazing idea and sat back and was like, and, and now how do I bring this to life? And, and my sister went to Stanford for her MBA and I kind of picked up the phone and called her and was like, so does this mean I need an MBA, right? Like if I'm transitioning for, you know, from the not-for-profit world and I have this idea and I want to bring it to life, I actually have no idea how to do this. And, and I think one of the things that I realized was that for a company like ours, where it's really about reaching as many people as possible to maximize the scale of impact, we need a VC-backed solution. We, we need scale. We need growth. Uh, and that much I recognized. Um, but I, I, I desperately needed skills and people to do this with. And a lot of the 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 well the founder the global founder of uh, Antler was in my class at Harvard and a lot of the founders here as well are right. um, not so far away from me uh, the Harvard undergrad they're all a lot of them are Harvard undergrads so yep. it was a friend of a friend who was like this is this is the program that probably answers most of the the, the problems that you've articulated and I was like okay let me check it out and I, I started you know learning more about Antler and it seemed like this amazing and it was this amazing solution that enabled me to not have to spend like a quarter of a million dollars and two full years getting yet another degree. And at this point, I'm kind of already um, overqualified yep. and instead gain really practical knowledge in a really short amount of time while meeting other people who were equally committed. I mean, we'd all quit our jobs. So we were all full time doing this. Like we'd yep. made radical life choices to say, we are ready to start companies of our own. And it was through that program that I was able to, yeah, meet my co-founders. Um, and, and yeah. Here we are. Here we are today. We, and, and obviously we, we, met through, we met through the Antler Angel program. And so that's how we met. And that's how you're on this show as well. So, so um, tell everyone where you're at right now, because you're at quite a pivotal moment in, in the business life cycle, right? And it's, it, yeah, I think it's really yeah. important that we talk about that. Yeah, look, I, I think the, fir the first thing in terms of where we're at right now is uh, to tell you more about my co-founder, Ben, and, and why this partnership works so well, because I think that it's, it's you know, uh, I, I bring in idea and expertise, but I, I think that this is actually really where Antler's value kicks in, right? So um, Ben and I met the night before, well, before the program even started at, yep. at one of those, um, the, the sort of like events that they had where they were bringing founders together. And it was this almost immediate connection because what we both kind of recognized in each other is that we're really about building a purpose-driven business and there are strong values that we have that tie us together. Um, and yet Ben's entire expertise. He's originally a management consultant and is that person that uh, then moved into startups where for quite a number of years and across a number of different startups was that person who was gone to to say, okay, here's a new product we want to launch, figure out how to do it, build it, product manage it, and grow it. And yep. he would take it from like zero to X number of million in, you know, a very short amount of time. So he had that exact complementary skill set that I lacked. Um, and together, what we recognize is that we have this amazing like um, synergy where we really push each other. Um, <laughs> why do you think what you think? Why is this like the, the best way forward for the company? And I think it's that, that kind of engagement that we have that has enabled us to get to a point where actually like, you know, we, um, I guess, sort of formed the company in February-ish. We got Antler funding in April. Yep. It's August now and we've launched on the app store. So it's it's still in, in, in uh, it's private uh, in the sense that we're trying to start getting um, our early users onto the app, yep. but we actually have an app and it's uh, <laughs> been, it's been so quick. Uh, the ability to execute that he's brought has just been incredible. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that, that ability to, to sort of break it down and I'm like big and lofty with these ideas and I want to get this done. I want to get this done. Yep. And he'll sort of step back and say, wait, okay. You know, that, that sort of that build the skateboard to get the bike, to get the, you know, breaking it down and saying, okay, wait, what here is really, what constitutes a skateboard? that we need to build first. Um, and, and yeah, our, our MVP or our alpha or whatever we want to call that version that we're ready to start onboarding early users um, is ready. Yeah, that's great. I know. And you know what? It is super quick. It is super quick. Um, so impressed with the speed of that. 
And then, so from a business-wise, obviously you've got your Antler funding initially um, and you're, you're in the midst of doing a capital raise right now. Is that right? We are. We're, we're actually, um, I mean, you know, Steve, one of the things that uh, you'd, you'd, you, you were going to ask was what is one of the most challenging moments. And yep. if I can maybe indulge in a bit of a challenge as I talk about fundraising. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay. Because I like, honestly, fundraising um, has been so new for me. And, uh, <laughs> you know, for all of the other uh, female founders out there, um, there is this, this really interesting um, TED talk out there that talks about uh, the, the specific bias that that surrounds um, f- female founders who are trying to raise and why it's actually harder for females to, to, to raise money um, because of the types of questions we get asked. Um, and, and, you know, having to be rec- to cog- be cognizant of that and then develop a skill set to respond to difficult questions with really positive answers uh, that show the company in, in, in the best light has, has been such a growing pro- like growth pro- process of growth for me. Oh, um, and, and I think um, th- this, this fundraising journey, um, it starts hard, right? Like yep. getting those first checks. And I mean, look, I, I don't even think you know this, Steve, but actually the, the second check we got, it was this like, re- it was a pretty large check. And um, it was the second check that we got. Well, actually, it wasn't even a check. It was the second verbal commitment we got. Yep. And we got, oh, yes, okay, we, we got this verbal commitment. Let's go and get our safe documentation together, right? Yep. So we go and we go back and forth with our lawyers. We figure out what's, like, the best safe template to use. And I think it took us two to three weeks um, to get the documents together. Mm-hmm. Um, and we go back to this, this individual and... Um, a couple of weeks later, they pull out. And this was, it was probably one of the hardest moments that we've experienced in our journey because you have more than 50. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's gut wrenching, right? Um, you feel like you're on this amazing trajectory. You scored a huge check. Uh, it was more than 50% of our commitments at that time. Wow. It, yeah. it killed our momentum. It was really, really difficult. Um, We've recovered. We've more than recovered. I mean, yep. we've got yourself on the table and, and we've got amazing investors at the table. We've actually closed a few hundred thousand dollars since, right? So um, we just have a little bit more to go um, before uh, we'll close this round and, and we're, we're fine. But at the time, it, it made us really question, um, you know, are, are we are we on the right journey? Like, you know, we even started questioning, is our product roadmap correct? Yep. Um, and, and, you know, it took a lot of courage and time to step back and say, okay, um, this is what we're trying to do. Let's refine our messaging. Let's refine what, you know, our entire plan is. And um, I think we're all the more better for it, but it's, it's to say that, you know, it's, it's not easy. Right. And, and it's it's to have that sort of self-confidence and guts to, to be able to go through that. um, Yeah. All right. So I got a question for you. So I saw, I met you first on the pitch, the antler pitch night. And then yeah. we did a, another one-on-one one, I don't know, about a week later, right? Was that, yeah. bef- which is when we decided to commit, but was that before you'd had the pullout or was that after you'd had the pullout? Can you remember? Because it was ah. pretty early on before. It was after. It was after. Okay, because it ah. was a pretty, I thought your pitch on the pitch night was very slick. So that's um, that's, well, that's why we had the second one, right? And that's why we are here today. But um, that's interesting, yeah, that you got it that early and then, yeah, that would have been that would have been hard. Well, look, it's yeah. it, it, now you're on this journey. As you well know, unfortunately, it is a huge part of your job is to continuously go back and ask for more money at different phases of the life cycle, and you'll get better at it the whole time. But um, it's interesting. Now, talk to me. I, I've got to bring COVID and, and lockdowns up because we're right in the heart of it, hence the reason you're on a screen and not sitting opposite me. How has that impacted you guys starting a business in this mayhem and and look, we started nudge just before it as well so i'm aware but my business is very different to yours you're building a product business so how has that been you know isolated from your founder that you've just met that you've just suddenly had a you know a meeting of minds with and isolated from your ability to go and see and, and actually shake investors hands and and all those different things and and the loneliness of sometimes working alone which is which, as much as we can do these video things, it's not quite the same. How's that been for you at this stage of your very first business in this very scary new world that you're in? How's that been? Tell me. 
well, superficially, it saves us costs, right? Because <laughs> it saves well, us yeah, all the true. space. <laughs> so we can count that as a win. Um, but if, if I'm being really, yeah, I mean, much more seriously, it's, um, I, th- I think the advantage that we have is that we, the formative months, we were face to face. So we got to start by building really strong relationships. Um, we've Our partners have met each other. We formed strong social bonds that yeah. I think are really, really critical um, to, to building trust. Um, I th- think the hardest part of lockdown has less been about our relationship with each other and more been about our own individual. Like I, I think, and I speak for me, I think that for Ben, it's probably like he, he's um, more able to, to be practical. And Ben's actually had a baby um, through lockdown yes. as well. So I saw the other day um, on, on Zoom, he told me, you remember it was crying. And I was like, <laughs> how old he was? It was a few weeks. I know, crazy. <laughs> We told, yeah, exactly. So, so I think I think that for him, probably becoming a father is um, a, a bigger change than, than lockdown, and potentially <laughs> lockdown helps with the balance because I think so. he can he can manage everything quite well. Um, I struggle, right? Like I think I work best. I don't even need to be in an office. And, and we've always been um, three days in, two days at home um, because we, we all kind of value like, you know, the extra time that you save by not going in. So we've always been a bit hybrid. I think what I miss most is not being able to work at a cafe, um, to be <laughs> honest. Uh, but I think what we've been able to do is leverage the personal challenges that we've been facing to strengthen our relationship with each other by being really open and honest about where we are emotionally on an everyday basis. So there are days where I will call Ben up and say, I couldn't work today because emotionally I was like coping with being in one of the 12 LGAs and only suddenly realizing I can only go outside for exercise for an hour a day when I'm used to doing two hours of exercise a day, right? Like these, you know, and, and this is emotionally quite, quite, strenuous and I needed today to cope. Um, and that has, that, that, that openness that we have has really, really brought us closer together. And then the ability to say, all right, Ben, it's the weekend. And all of a sudden now I'm like all like guns blazing and ready to work. Can you give me a couple hours yeah. and not having to be constrained by that? So I think it's, it's, it's definitely not easy, but it has brought us closer together in ways that are potentially unexpected. That's good. And look, I, I, is uh, is there anything new that you're doing now? I see a surfboard right behind you, right? So is there anything new? And it looks like it's got plenty of wax on. That's a that's a used surfboard. It's not a uh, not one that's oh, up yeah. there just for just for looks. So you can set. Someone's put a lot of rotations of the wax on that over the over the years. But have, have you developed any new habits, or is there anything that you're doing now that you never did before that you particularly never thought you would? Maybe that's been that's sort of been a product of this. Of the lockdown specifically, um, the yeah. lockdown and the and more just I the have, pandemic. I think it doesn't have to be specifically the lockdown because the pandemic's changed the world. And there's no question, and and it's not going to go back. So that I think, and I'll tell you why I asked that question. As a as a mm. recruiter, we speak to countless people, um, and we see yeah. trends because we're speaking to so many people. The biggest yeah. shift I've seen is that so many more people, and you've kind of got this already, so this wouldn't be your answer, but it's just an example. So many people are coming to us wanting a job that means something more and that has an impact. They don't just want a job. I think before there was a lot of people who wanted a job, right? Because they wanted to pay the bills and they wanted to do the things outside of their job and the job was a means to an end. And we used to interview those people all the time and that was fine. There's a lot less of those now. A lot more people are wanting more from that. They're wanting, they're trying to find more meaning in their work than perhaps they did or trying to find something where they can have more impact or the business is doing something more. And that's fundamentally changed across a huge, huge range of people. Um, And they want to work differently with the work from home and all that kind of stuff. You know, those are things, these are conversations we never had before that people almost lead with now. So I think the world has changed that way. And that's an example. Is there anything like that that's changed in your world? Because you'd kind of already made that decision, I guess, before. But since that pandemic, do you think anything's really sort of clicked in your head maybe that you might, you might not, you know, sometimes people won't even work this out when I ask them the question. So. <laughs> I mean, th- look, there, there are multiple ways to answer that question, right? I mean, I think that from a very practical perspective, um, it's, 
one of the challenges with, um, and, and this is to, to your question about employment and work, uh, the, the pandemic has made it very expensive to, to hire tech onshore yes, and has. has made hiring offshore much more attractive, right? Because yep. it's, um, it, it's actually like, what's the difference? Because in both situations, Thank you're virtually on. operating anyway. Um, <laughs> so, and you know, if, if you can find quality, um, I, I think that that's one thing that that's definitely there. But um, I'm too new to the tech world to say if that's a, a recent trend or because I've kind of come into the space uh, in the middle of a pandemic and labor shortage here in it's Australia. Definitely, anyway. It's definitely an impact. Um, <laughs> What was that? It's definitely had an impact. I'm not new enough. I can tell you it's yeah. had a huge impact. You're, you're right. You've got, you okay. got that right. <laughs> okay. So that's that's one. I think the um, uh, the other thing that I would, I mean, maybe I can tell you a story that kind of is, so, I mean, I, the story I told you earlier about my entire life is the real why, right? Yeah. Um, but there was a COVID moment uh, that was the catalyst and that final trigger that kind of was the, you know, what was it? The straw that broke the camel's back type yep. thing. Uh, and, and, and that, that was, that was my COVID aha moment. And it happened when, um, uh, my uncle passed away in Florida and, and it wasn't, he didn't pass away from COVID, uh, but it was a sudden decline that was unexpected. And because of COVID, none of us could go to his funeral. Hmm. Um, and I think I, I, I'm not sure if I've mentioned, but I've, I was commissioned to write a book last year on um, the history of Ismailis from East Africa, which is kind of my own heritage. And as I was writing, that book is, is it's still with publishers. It's not out yet, but it's supposed to be for a non-academic audience. Yep. So in order to make that history more readable, I drew on my own ancestors history. So it's sort of like a very manual version of storytelling, actually, yeah. um, where I was capturing, interviewing and capturing uh, the stories of my own family members and starting each chapter with one. And this uncle of mine, um, who's an uncle that none of us were very close to growing up because of the distance, we never got to know him. He, his story was actually one of his, his you know, he, he left Uganda from the time of Idi Amin, right? So fascinating stories there. Yeah. Um, and I, I, his, his story was, it was the, the beginning of, of one of those chapters. I, when he passed away, I, that, that 1000 word story that I captured, I circulated with our family and, and our way of healing was to get on these Zoom calls. And as we started discussing his story, um, the first thing that I noticed was just how healing it was to have his That's story captured, preserved. Um, it gave everyone a sense of like, oh, we, someone actually took the time to get to know him and document stuff we had no idea about. Yep. Um, and that was was quite illuminating for me. The other thing that I found really illuminating was that I had cousins who were in their late 30s, early 40s with young children who started calling me up after that and saying, can you give me a list of questions? I really want to capture my parents' stories. And I thought, oh my God, really? Like, I'm not just a nerd who <laughs> likes doing this for fun. Um, People who you know, pe people in the business world, people in the medical professions, they want to take the time to do this, and they don't know how. And I think that was a bit of an aha moment, right? Where, yeah. um, and what what is it about COVID? It's one, it's distance and the inability to travel, right? So yep. we're we're separated, and and two, the the increased valuation on family, and three, the increased anxiety over of mortality. Like we're all more aware of 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 our mortality. We are, yeah. I think uh, that's and I true. think, yeah, I think that's yeah. absolutely true. Okay, and if we combine those two last things we've talked about, so let's combine okay. COVID, and let's combine the hardest thing you've ever been through, which is essentially raising money, right, and the capital raising. What have you learned yeah. about yourself going through mm -hmm. both of those things? Because those kinds of things teach you things about yourself that you probably just didn't realize because you never had the time. Yeah. Um, I have learned first about myself that if I, when I find that thing that is right now, I am doing my life's work, 
Yep. I have found that thing that. that brings every, like, you know, I mean, I've made so many pivots in my life, like film production, academia, community, nonprofit work, like pivot after pivot. And I found that thing that brings everything together. And when I have that drive, I have real happiness, right? Like fulfillment that no matter what else is going on, I feel a real sense of purpose and I found it, right? Like this is this is my life's work and I'm going to crack this. So I think that's, a, and then that leads to the other thing, which is that I've got real grit. <laughs> like, <Yep. laughs> whatever it is, I can do it, you know? And, and yeah, I'll, I'll push through. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. Last question. You mentioned that you are growing and hiring, and I know that anyway, obviously. Um, if people are out there watching this, which they will be, of course, and they're thinking this woman and her business sound amazing, I'm really interested in learning more about it. In your own mind and your own eyes, why would someone want to come and work at Storytiling? Well, you've already hit one of them because people want to make a social impact in the world, right? I think I think that's like we're a purpose-driven business. Um, the other reasons are potentially our work culture, right? We're really high energy high input, every single person's opinion matters. Um, and what we're looking for are, are people who have passion, drive, want to innovate. Yep. Um, they want to think outside the box, bring their ideas to the table. And they, they, ha they have really high standards, right? Like with that, this is the thing with Ben and I is that it's, you know, we, we really hold each other to account and we push each other very respectfully, but Essentially, we're driven by growth and we're looking for other people to join the team who want to, in turn, push us to grow and also want themselves to be pushed to, to realize their full potential. And, and that's really at the core of our company's culture. You know, the other thing that I, I'd love to say, Steve, is yeah. diversity uh, within our team is so important to us. So we currently have five people on our team um, yep. and three of them are female, including tech, which is, is a bit rare, right? Um, very rare. Of the five of us, I'm the only person who grew up speaking, speaking English at home. Uh, and, and even my, my parents really? didn't always speak English to us, even though I responded in English most of the time. Um, so, yeah. Well, that makes, you know, finding people for you that do speak English at home an easier task in terms of your diversity targets compared to most people. You're the opposite. So that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> That is awesome. I have so enjoyed today. Your energy is very infectious. You can see that you are doing your life's work. You can see that you are completely embedded in this and that it's it's what you want to do and you not you don't want to be doing anything else right now. And I can very much see that in you and I think it's awesome. Um, so look, congratulations on where you're up to. I'm very, very excited to see the app actually come out and be able to use it. Um, and good luck with the the ending of the uh, the capital raise. And if anyone else there's interested in that capital raise, you can certainly uh, contact us or, or certainly contact yourselves. Your details will be on the on the thing when this comes out. Um, and look, I look, so look forward to watching your journey. I really do. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. And if any early users want want to start using storytelling, then please also storytelling.com join our waitlist. Yeah, we'll stick Thank a link you. on that as well. Fantastic. Excellent. Thanks, Aya. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Steve.